The purpose of this little video is to talk about um, aesthetic language um, and particularly um, think about how to write a descriptive essay but also how to analyze a passage uh, in a question A if they ask you about the writer's use of aesthetic language. So it starts just by looking at the fact that you know there is a pattern of them asking you to write or giving you the option on paper one in the composition section. Don't forget the composition section is worth 100 marks. So this year that's even more important because that's equal to 36 percent or 35 percent of the marks for um, the Leaving Cert cohort of 2020 but you know in a normal year so if you're in fifth year then you know it's still worth 25 percent of all the marks so you think about all the work that you do for your your single text or you know Othello or your comparative texts and you think about you know all that stuff you have to learn about general vision and viewpoint and how to write those comparative essays and all that poetry stuff that's all really important but this is the most important part of the paper so we've talked already about writing personal essays and um, you know with a speech is an option here that we'll be looking at too um, the discursive essay that video i've done so you know here we're talking about the descriptive essay and i'll do another one on the short story um soon so just to have a quick look okay so here's 2015 write a descriptive essay which captures life in ireland in 2015 from the point of view of an observant time traveler okay so that's an interesting the title uh, 2016 write a descriptive essay in which you make your take your readers on an urban journey no bother 2017 write a descriptive essay entitled night scene very very broad and nice uh, 2018 uh, write a descriptive essay in which you capture how the landscape reflects the transition of the seasons. Okay, you may choose to include some or all of the seasons in your essay, which basically meant you could have just written an essay about winter, you know. 2019, um, write a descriptive essay which captures a sense of the difference between dawn and dusk and celebrates both the beginning and the end of the day. So that was probably the hardest descriptive essay title um, that's been on in a while. So, you know, you'd have to really think carefully about that one. What's really interesting is I haven't got the 2020 one up because they didn't ask one in 2020. So it's important that you remember this. While there has been a pattern in recent years of them putting the descriptive essay on the paper, it, it was rarely on until about seven, eight years ago. So if you look at the papers from 2020, sorry, from 2001 through to 2012, you know, there was hardly a descriptive essay option. And then in the last 10 years, it's been an option, but it's not a guaranteed option. Now, again, if you were to talk to somebody in the SEC, they'd say there are no guaranteed options. But we know from the pattern of papers that there's always a personal essay, there's always a speech, there's always a short story amongst the seven options. So what you've got to do is you've got to decide, like, okay, over the course of, you know, if you're doing Leave Insert 2020, over the course of the next three weeks or so, you know, I've got to really think about what type of essay I'm going to write, depending on the question. If you're leaving to a leave insert 2021, you've got to be thinking about, you know, preparing, doing as much reading as you can, understanding the different elements of genre um, for um, a descriptive essay, if that's something that you're thinking about, maybe as an option for you. OK, so those are past questions in terms of composition, but there are also past questions in terms of analysis of somebody else's writing. So again, you've seen this document before, but we'll talk about it really quickly. So here we go, 2018, asked you to look at a piece and talk about whether or not the writer showed superb narrative skills, including the effective use of aesthetic language. 2017, talked about a writer's effective use of aesthetic language and the impact of that on their memoir. Don't forget what a memoir is. A memoir is a piece of personal writing. 2016 asked about how elements of narrative and aesthetic language are used effectively in the piece. And that was a really easy question because it just asked about engaging the reader. So that just meant look, making it interesting. The 2019 paper didn't ask explicitly on aesthetic language, but it did ask these two questions, both of which would allow you to bring in the writer's use of aesthetic language. The first one is identify and discuss four elements of the writer's style which contribute to making this a good example of a personal essay, if there are descriptive passages in it, and don't forget, aesthetic language means descriptive language, and it doesn't necessarily mean description uh, for the sake of creating beauty. It means the beautiful use of language uh, for our purposes. Um, but aesthetic language 
descriptive passages in any piece of personal writing will make it more colourful, more interesting, more engaging, more uh, memorable. So you can absolutely bring in aesthetic uh, techniques. And in this one, then it said identify and discuss four elements of the language of narration, evident on page four of text two, that contribute to making a character really convincing. Well, if the writer uses aesthetic language to describe the physical appearance of the character, or the you know the, the 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 personality of the character or the description of the character is vivid. Well, that's aesthetic language. So these are all things that can be brought in. Okay, now just to remember, when we look at the word aesthetic, we mean descriptive. Okay, and descriptive means does the writer succeed in stimulating our imagination? Okay, and what does that mean? Does the writer succeed in allowing us? creating the illusion that we can see things we can't see, smell things we can't smell, you know, hear things we can't hear. Does the writer succeed in using words the way painters use paint to create an image or to create imagery which is vivid and real and stimulates our imagination? Okay? So, remember, when you're talking about descriptive writing, if you're going to write a descriptive essay or you're going to analyse a piece of writing um, in terms of aesthetic language, you're looking out for, if you're writing, to create sensual imagery. That means imagery that appeals to the senses and we have more than one sense. Okay? Some people believe we have a sixth sense, but we certainly have five scientifically provable senses and they are sight, smell, taste, hearing and touch. So we're looking for imagery which appeals to the visual, olfactory, gustatory, aural and tactile senses. Now, that, those key words there, they're really important. If I give you a reading comprehension passage and I say I want you to analyse it for aesthetic language, I'll be looking for you to use that vocabulary. If I read a descriptive essay, if you decide to hand me up a descriptive essay, I'll be looking for imagery which appeals to all those senses because that's what descriptive writing or aesthetic writing should do. We need to be aware that there are little tricks you can do. Now, I've been through this already. I'm not going to um, spend loads of time going through this. But we know that writers use metaphor, symbolism. They use simile, those you know, direct comparisons using like or as. Personification, which is a form of metaphor. Onomatopoeia, which appeals to the, um, to the um, aural sense. You know, oxymorons or, or, or um, you know, juxtapositions, you know, direct contrast, like terrible beauty, excellent foppery, foolish honesty. There's loads of them, loads of them, loads of them, okay? So we won't worry too much about that, that technical thing here because I've been through that in class. But what I want to do is talk about, you know, the attention to detail that writers, um, uh, when writers pay attention to detail through their choice of verbs, their use of adjectives or their noun adjective combination, their verb adverb, adverb combinations and um, their, their ability to look to create imagery. And what I want to do now is, is read through some examples of really brilliant aesthetic writing and just talk about why I would describe them as being brilliant and what techniques the writers use in order to make them vivid or powerful or interesting and so on and so forth, okay? So these kind of words are the words you want. If I read your descriptive essay, these are the kind of words that I want you want me to use when I'm writing my comment back. Oh, well done. This is a, that was a very vivid passage or I really thought that the, the description of the night scene was evocative or, you know, when you, were, when you were describing the train pulling out from the station, I found that the imagery was cinematic, which means when I could read it, it was moving and I could see it. So that's all the kind of stuff you're looking for in terms of, you know, an examiner's response to your descriptive writing and your commentary on somebody else's descriptive writing, depending on whether you're doing a composition or an A. So I put together this little document, okay? And what I did was I went and I took um, a few books off the old bookshelf and I put together a selection of, um, of um, examples of really good uh, descriptive writing. And here we have an extract from The Last Temptation by Val McDermott. Now, if you're in any way into crime writing, you know, um, uh, that kind of genre of writing, Val McDermott is a brilliant Scottish um, um, writer. Um, but she's also, like, what, she, uh, as a genre writer, she might be kind of, like, some of the, there's, there's, a, there's an element of snobbery when it comes to, you know, what books we like, you know. But, like, good writing is good writing, the, regardless of genre. And Val McDermott is a very, very talented writer. Just have a look at this. I'm, just have a look at this. So this is an extract from her book, The Last Temptation. I'm just going to do something really quickly here. Give me a second. 
Okay? Now, he opened the door and led with his head. His smile stretched to breaking point. Dr. Calvert, I'm Hans Hockenstein. He continued into the room, fixing his eyes on the woman emerging from behind the desk. She was tiny. She could have been... She couldn't have been more than five feet tall with a fine boned gamine face. Her chestnut hair was cropped close to her head, combined with her outfit of smartly casual top and capri pants, which he recognised from the old movies Gunter loved to watch as an homage to Audrey Hepburn. Unfortunately, he thought, she didn't have the eyes to carry it off. Dr. Calvert's dark eyes were small, set close against the narrow bridge of her nose, making her look slightly cross rather than carefree and vulnerable. She held out a slim, bony hand to him and he took it gently, enveloping it in what suddenly felt like an excess of damp, sweaty flesh. Now that is brilliantly descriptive. It is a brilliantly descriptive piece of characterization. But let's just talk about some of the things that this writer does to make her writing descriptive. So, okay, let's look at this example down here, okay? She's shaking hands and her hand is described as a slim, bony hand. Now, the word hand there is a noun. What writer has done is added the adjectives slim and bony. Now what you've got there is not just a visual image of the hand, but you've also got a tactile image. You can really feel what the hand feels like because it's bony and small. Then you get the further note that he took the hand, but he took it gently. So took is the past tense of a verb to describe how it was taken. That's an, a verb An adverb combination. Then the choice of the verb enveloping it. It's very, very precise because what you do is you get that juxtaposition of the size of her hand, which is slim and bony, and the size of his hand, which is obviously huge because it completely covers it. So that choice, of, that choice of verb enveloping is so precise and it creates a vivid image. All of a sudden you can see what's being described clearly in your mind's eye. And finally, you have this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful moment where it says, suddenly it felt like an excess of damp, sweaty flesh. And again, damp, the handshake or the hand is described as, as um, damp, sweaty, flesh, sorry. So the hand is a noun, damp, sweaty, flesh, damp and sweaty, the, the flesh is the noun, damp and sweaty are the adjectives describing the noun. And that's not a visual image, that's a tactile image. So there you have a writer using aesthetic language we have just this this moment where a handshake takes place but it's the camera is zoned in good descriptive writers pay attention to detail the camera is zoned in we can see one character's hand we can see the other character's hand we get the sense of what the thing looked like we get the sense of what the moment felt like and how does the writer do it by using really complicated you know metaphors and similes and all sorts of stuff no not at all by ad adding adjectives to nouns and by by adding adverbs to verbs and by being very 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 careful and precise with the verb selection. And as a result, you have imagery, which is sensual because you have um, um, tactile and visual imagery. So that's a really good example of descriptive writing. I want to go up here as well, okay? So the opening I love, by the way, I actually, it's just, it's just lovely. It's a very, um, I'm gonna change that there. I took it out of the novel. I'm sure it was LED in the novel, but it should be LED. Anyway, um, 
you have this gorgeous opening sequence which kind of captures the moment when this person comes in and you get this visual image of his smile stretched to breaking point you know very 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 um lovely attention to detail you get a sense of the character okay you know he's smiling but he feels like false or um um as if he's um feigning relaxation maybe he's stressed and that's just from that you know the smile being stretched to breaking point but anyway that's not what's interesting what's interesting is this we get this um adverb sorry pronoun she right there's she right and what do we learn about her right number one she's tiny number two she couldn't have been more than five feet tall number three her face is fine boned and gamine, which means kind of boyish. Okay. We find out that her hair is chestnut, that's the color, and cropped close to her head. We find out that her outfit is a smartly casual top and capri pants that basically means three quarter length trousers okay so what you've got there is a brilliant example of characterization and the language you see that's saying that because it's saying i have to spell it with a z but i refuse to bend to this fascist this determination to be spelled like americans i'm going to ignore it okay so what you've got there is Really, really simply, you've got vivid characterization, the physical essence the physical description of the character is vivid. Okay? And why is it vivid? Because the writer is using language in a measured and simple way but is adding all of these incremental details that create the image you know what incremental means like say if you're say if you're getting paid say say life goes really 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 well like you know and in 10 or 20 years time you're earning like you know i don't know 200 grand a year right there if you're earning 200 grand a year life's going really really well okay but you don't get like you know your check for 200 grand at the end of the year your 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 salary is broken into increments so most people are paid paid monthly some people are paid weekly some people are paid uh, uh, every two weeks so you're getting paid 12 times a year maybe or 52 times a year, whatever. That's what incremental means. So it means in bits. And what the writer does here is slows down writing really simple short sentences and just gives us all these details. First of all, we get a sense of the size of her. Then we get a sense of her face. Then we get a sense of her hair. Then we get a sense of the way she's dressed. And all of a sudden, our visual sense means that we can see the character. And that's really, 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 a really brilliant example of descriptive writing. Okay, so that's the kind of thing you're looking for in um, if I'm reading somebody else's, if I'm reading your essay and you're writing me a descriptive essay, that's the kind of detail I want to see. I want you to slow down. Descriptive writing is not narrative writing. Descriptive writing is part of writing a story, but you can be descriptive without, you know, write without telling a story. And that's what I'm looking for in a descriptive essay. There can be a narrative frame. That's allowed. That's within the, that's within the, you know, the, 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 remit of a descriptive essay but the focus has to be not on what happens next that's plots the focus has to be on stimulating the imagination paying attention to detail now that's an example of characterization i want to show you an example of setting description now from just you know a fantastic i'll just bring that up there sorry a fantastic book i can't tell you it's one of my books of the year um hamlet by maggie o'farrell now i'm a shakespeare freak i love shakespeare so much and this um, book is, uh, you know, I was always going to be buying it because it's about Shakespeare and his family. But it's just regardless of that, it's just a brilliant book. And again, look, I'm sitting here at a desk, right? And I've got 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Behind the Scenes of the Museum, The Purpose by Mark Haddon, uh, Hamlet, uh, The Last Temptation, uh, Jane Eyre, The White Book, Americana, Star of the Sea, uh, what else is there, um, Strange Flowers. Look, here's the thing, right? The more you read, the better you'll get at this. So if you're somebody who's in fifth year and you have access to a library, either online or in you know, real terms, and you want to you improve, read a lot. And if you spend three months of the summer and you're not reading, well, then you're giving your, your, that's three months less preparation for this very important part of the exam. Now, it might not matter to you. You might go, I don't care. That's fine. But if it does matter to you, sitting down and reading without analyzing, without ruining it by taking apart every section and saying, oh, look at the adjective noun combination or the, you know, the precise verb selection or the simile. You don't have to do that, but you do have to be reading if this is an option for you. And if you're in sixth year and your exam is three weeks away, I can't, I can't tell you how much I think if the descriptive essay or the narrative essay is an option for you going into the exam, I can't tell you how much I think sitting down for an hour every day and reading good fiction will help you. Okay, that's study. Here's a great example of setting description from Maggie O'Farrell's um, Hamlet. It's gorgeous. I have to say, it's just a great book. Anyway, sorry, being boring as usual. You don't care. You're probably all asleep. So here we go. You ready? The smell of his grandparents' home is always the same. A mix of wood, smoke, polish, leather, wool. Now straight away, what you've got there is Maggie O'Farrell being aware of the fact that we have more than one sense. So we have a setting description. And what have we got? We've got the olfactory sense targeted. Okay, the olfactory sense is your sense of smell. And she gives us this list. Look at the list. Wood smoke, polish, leather, wool. And she gives us all of these different um, details, these four details. And those details help us understand that the place must have a very overwhelming smell. It builds the descriptive power. It makes the description um, plausible. In other words, believable. She then goes on and says, and she writes this in the, in, the, in the present tense, which is not a great, oh yeah, sorry, another thing. If you're writing a descriptive essay or if you're writing a, a, a short story, I'm, I'm, by the way, again, big fan of Maggie O'Farrell, love that book, Hamlet, but she's a professional writer. If you're a Leaving Cert student, my advice is flipping, write in the past tense, just write in the past tense, because most students find it really, really hard to pull off writing in the present tense, and it can be... Um, it can result in essays which are extremely confused and difficult to follow. It is similar yet indefinably different from the adjoining two-room apartment built by his grandfather in a narrow gap next to the larger house where he lives with his mother and sisters. Just look at all the detail. So talk about the smell in that place. And then it tells us that this place has an adjoining two-room apartment. Okay. It was a, built by his grandfather. Another little detail. There's a narrow gap where this house was built. And that narrow gap put the small apartment beside the larger house. Sorry, I'm going to run out of colours here. Where he lives with his mother and sisters. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful description. Again, what's the writer doing? Focusing the camera in through the attention to detail. Building the sense of place here rather than character. Sometimes you cannot understand why this might be. The two dwellings are, after all, separated only by a thin, wattled wall. What, are, what about that for writing? But the air in each place is of a different ilk, a different scent. Again, referring to the olfactory sense. A different temperature, referring there to the tactile sense. But look, just look at that. A thin, wattled wall. What is wall? Wall is a noun. What has the writer done? The writer has added adjectives. And the writer has deliberately, I think, anyway. You probably get Maggie O'Farrell on and she go, no, I didn't do that on purpose. Um, so it's not like that. I don't think like that when I write. It's more natural. But adding wattle and wall together means there is an alliteration there. And the alliteration does help sharpen the image. Very, very, very good writing. And then this, listen to this. The house whistles with drafts and eddies of air. Now, again, when you hear the word whistle, 
you can hear the sound whistle, and that's an example of onomatopoeia. So here the writer is, refer is, is appealing to our aural sense. So good descriptive writers appeal to the visual sense. Yes, they have to show us things, but they also appeal to the olfactory sense, stimulate our sense of smell, the aural sense, stimulating our sense of hearing, and the, um, what other one that I mentioned there, uh, the tactile sense. Now, we have, there's no example yet of, um, of the uh, gustatory sense. But look, whistles, and then you got tapping, and tapping is onomatopoeic, and hammering, and hammering is onomatopoeic, of his grandfather's workshop. So now not only do you get a sense of what it smells like, but now you can hear and, 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 and the, the relationship of the buildings and the dimensions of the buildings, but now you can hear the sounds. But the raps and a rap is the noise of, that somebody makes when they tap on a window and calls of customers at the windows with noise, with the noise and welter of the courtyard at the back with the sound of his uncles coming home. And all of a sudden now you can hear voices. Now that is outstanding standing aesthetic writing, descriptive writing. It is, it is, when I read that, I'm not reading a book. When I read that, I am gone off into my imagination and I'm in this house in Stratford in the 15, you know, 90s or the first decade of the 1600s and I'm with Hamnet as he goes through his granddad's house. Brilliantly written work. And again, and I'm sorry if I'm causing offence to people. Does Maggie O'Farrell, who is this you know, wonderfully talented contemporary writer, does she use loads of big words? Does she use language in a way which alienates the reader, which makes the reader feel like, you know, that they're not bright enough to understand this because you must be, have to be very educated? No. She is a careful, you know, uh, she, she uses her craft in a careful way slowly building up detail, creating the image. And if you're going to write a descriptive essay, that's the kind of care that's required. Sensual language, attention to detail, use of techniques like, um, you know, precise verb selection and, and uh, adjectives added to nouns, onomatopoeia, and so on. I'll do one more. I'll do one more. Okay? Final one. Will I do this one? Dum, 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 dum. Yeah, because there's a couple of good similar. So this is from Behind the Scenes at the Museum by Kate Atkinson. Again, Kate Atkinson, my God, I can't tell you how good a writer she is. She's amazing. I mean, this woman, you know, I've read quite a few of her novels and she is one of the most imaginative writers you're going to come across. Please read, okay? Again, I'm talking about after you're leaving, sir, like in your life, it will enrich your life. So here we go, okay? So this is a brilliant description, again, of setting. But it also captures characterization, combination of the two. I just want to show you this because of a particular technique. So this scene is set in, um, in um, I'm just noticing there's a mistake there. Um, this scene is set um, during the First World War on the Western Front, uh, just before um, the whistle is going to be blown to, you know, go over the top and, um, and uh, launch an attack. Just listen to this. It was silent before the order came. Look at that, straight away, great sentence. What does it create? Tension. How is it created? Short sentences. But even that word silent appeals to the aural sense and it creates a sense of anticipation because that silent has to, silence has to end. The guns had stopped and there was no laughing or joking or anything. Just the silence of waiting. So there it is there twice now, the reference to silent and silence. So the repetition is creating emphasis. Okay, emphasizing this, the, you know, the absence of sound, contrasting it with what you normally hear. The guns, the laughing, the joking. There's none of that. And again, the tension is highlighted. Frank watched the clouds pass over in the blue sky above. Again, that shouldn't be capital S. Little puffs of white that were floating above no man's land as if it was any other bit of countryside and not the place where he was going to die shortly. You know, you just want to give that a boot a bus. You just want to give that a round of applause. It's just brilliant. You know, you're, you're all of a sudden, you're looking up and you see the clouds. You can see them, right? And they're, they, you can see the sky, right? And the sky is blue, okay? 
and the clouds are little puffs of white. So we have clouds, puffs of white, sorry, I never, white, adjective noun combination. We have uh, sky and blue, adjective noun combination, and suddenly we can see the scene. I'm sitting here right now and it's bloody lashing out. But in my imagination, I'm on the Western Front, I can hear the silence, I can feel the tension, and I can look up and I can see the white fluffy clouds passing by. The new lieutenant looked as green as the grass that didn't grow there anymore. And again, the reason I wanted to show you this one, look at that. Fantastic example of simile. You know, Stephen King, I rave about Stephen King. And again, the irony being, I haven't read very many of Stephen King's books because he writes in a genre that I don't, I don't not enjoy it because I don't approve of it. I just, I don't, I, I find life scary enough without reading, you know, some of the Stephen King stories, which are incredibly scary. But he's the master storyteller, you know, sorry, the, he's a, a master storyteller. And he uses similes all the time. I remember years ago doing a, an exercise with a fourth year group. We read The Body by Stephen King, you know, that short story that Stand By Me is based on. And we read The Body. And when we read it, I said, okay, come on, let's see if we can find a simile on every page. And pretty much we were able to. Those contrasts, those comparisons can work really, really well to stimulate the imagination. So this lieutenant is really bottling it. He's really afraid because he knows what's coming, this battle. And he's gone kind of green. And he's as green as the grass. And then the little note that didn't grow there anymore. And you get this all of a sudden vivid imagination. And not only that, but the writer follows it up with a double simile. Sorry, just let me do something here. When she says, you could see the beads of sweat. I'll just, okay. As big as raindrops on his forehead. But can't you, can't you see, can you see him now? Right, you can see him. You can feel the tension. You know where you are. You're in a trench. You look up, it's a blue sky. You can see the puffs of cloud. You can hear the silence. Your aural sense is stimulated. You look over, can't you see the lieutenant? He feels sick because he knows what's coming. You can see he's, he's gone green with nausea. And he's, he's, he's really, really, really terrified. And he's sweating. And the sweat is as big as raindrops on his forehead. So what you've got is vivid imagery. Similes, metaphors, figurative language, attention to detail, onomatopoeia. These are all things that you can use in order to, um, to um, stimulate the imagination. So there you go. I'll, I'll end that there because I don't want it to go on for too long. Okay, I'm conscious of the fact that these videos can be very, very, very boring and I'm sorry about that. So what I'm going to say is um, that is an introduction, an introduction, a kind of a, a revision of the key elements of aesthetic language. Um, I'll say that's part one. I might do another one. Let me know if you want, if you think another one might be useful. Okay, but through the usual channels. Okay, thank you.